You turn in your Bible with me this morning to the fourth chapter of Acts. The passage we read in that chapter is really a prayer, as you would realize, the first prayer indeed that is recorded for us in the book of Acts of the early church. It was prayer provoked by the first major crisis into which the early church came after Pentecost when Peter and John were imprisoned and threatened and warned that they must stop preaching in the name of Christ. And then verse 23 we read, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. Now the substance of their prayer is what someone has described as the basic conviction of the whole Bible. That is the conviction that God is sovereign, that he reigns as King and Lord over the whole universe that he has created, that he sits today on the throne exercising absolute sovereign control over the whole of the created order and over the whole of the historical process. That is the conviction that underlies this prayer and which truly undergirds the whole teaching of the Bible. It is indeed, in some senses, the central Christian conviction that God, our Savior, reigns enthroned in glory. And so the prayer begins in verse 24, Sovereign Lord. Now that conviction that God is on the throne and that he was overruling even the wrath of their enemies to his own purpose was vital for the apostles at this particular stage and crisis. But it is, I want to press upon you, equally vital for every one of us this morning. Indeed it is the answer to one of the basic questions in the human heart. The question which the late Dr. Francis Schaeffer used to say grumbled under the skin of every thinking man. The question, to whom does ultimate power belong? Is there any controlling hand on the apparent madness of the world in which we live? When you look at history, in all its seeming chaos and confusion and foolishness, is it possible to say that there is a sovereign hand controlling everything in the history of the world? More personally, it is the answer to the question that burns in all our hearts more acutely at some times than at others. Is it really true that God is working all things together for good to those who love him? Is God really sovereign over my personal history? Now these are crucial questions and they are answered in the two words by which the early Christians address God in verse 24, Sovereign Lord, they call him. And the rest of this prayer in Acts 4 is really an expansion of that conviction. As it were, the apostles take everything that is contained in that phrase by which they address God, Sovereign Lord, and they unpack it, as it were, in the succeeding part of the prayer. And they do so in four particular ways. You will notice they very simply are apparent from the 
text of the prayer as we have it from verse 24, they first address God as the sovereign Lord of creation. Verse 24, sovereign Lord who didst make the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Then they address God as the sovereign Lord of history. Verses 25 and 26, who by the mouth of our father David thy servant did say by the Holy Spirit, and they begin to quote from Psalm 2, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples imagine vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves in array and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. And there they are speaking of God's sovereign rule in history. And thirdly, they address him as the sovereign Lord of redemption. In verses 27 and 28, For truly in this city there were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever thy hand and thy plan had predestined to take place. He is the sovereign Lord of redemption. And finally in verses 29 and 30 they address him as the sovereign Lord over the contemporary scene in which they live. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to thy servants to speak thy word with all boldness while thou stretchest out thy hand and so on. Now I hope we may be able to look at this quite crucial truth for ourselves and our spiritual well-being, for our proper understanding of the Christian gospel, for our proper view of the world in which we live and the times in which we live, for the purposes of God's hand to be upon us as we think about our own lives with all our personal need that we may see what is involved in this glorious truth that God is the sovereign Lord. Above all other things, this is the conviction, of course, that lies behind all true Christian prayer. When we come to God and wait upon him and cry to him as these men did in Acts chapter 4, the basic conviction we have as we plead with God in such a situation or in any situation is that God reigns sovereign over all the affairs of men and nations, over heaven and earth and hell. And we come to him on that basis as the sovereign Lord, so that we may think aright and live aright and pray aright. Let us look together at what the apostles have to teach us about the sovereignty of God they come to him first as the sovereign Lord of creation, verse 24. Sovereign Lord, who didst make the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Now that is the first thing that persuades these apostles of God's unlimited power and sovereignty. They are persuaded of his sovereignty when they look at God's acts in creation. Here they are, you see, in the midst of a situation where fear has entered their hearts, obviously, by reason of the opposition that they have experienced and the threats that are still sounding in their ears. And what they are saying now as they come to plead with God, they are reminding themselves of his sovereignty in creation. They say, you are the Lord who has formed this universe in which we live. You have given life and breath to these very men who are our enemies. You are the Lord who has made all that is. And that enables them to plead with God and to press him concerning their particular need. It is, you see, one of the great bases of our thinking about God that he is the sovereign Lord of creation. If you have power to create the heavens of, and the earth as your sovereign act, then they are able to go on and say, look upon us in our present situation. The creation you see is presented in Scripture as a sovereign act of God. 
he speaks as a kingly creator and brings into being out of nothing all that is made. And that is why the doctrine of creation is so vital for us in our understanding of God, in our thinking about the world, in our thinking about prayer. The whole doctrine of creation is of absolutely fundamental importance for us. Now, evangelicals are often strong on the doctrine of redemption, but they are weak on the doctrine of creation. And I am sure it is partly for that reason that we have an inadequate view of God and an inadequate understanding of his power and glory. I wonder if you have noticed that again and again this is the argument that men of God in Scripture use as they come into God's presence to plead with him. Again and again what they are doing. For example, Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 32, they come to God and plead with him as the God who is first sovereign in creation. Jeremiah cries, after I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch the son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God, it is thou who hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and thine outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for thee. Now do you see how this vision of God as the sovereign Lord who has called the creation into being makes such a difference to men's thinking? But it is not only used by men as an argument as they plead with God. It is used by God as an argument to persuade his people to trust him. Do you remember how in Isaiah's prophecy God comes to his people wilting in the midst of all the difficulties and tribulations through which they had passed and he says to them lift up your eyes on high and see. Now what is it that they are to see? What vision is it that Isaiah longs that they might have? It is the vision of God as the sovereign creator. Lift up your eyes on high and see he who created these things. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord and my right is disregarded from my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Now do you see what God is doing? He is using the doctrine of creation and his sovereignty in creation to persuade his people to trust him. Now here is what the apostles are doing as they come into God's presence and you will see how immensely relevant all this is to the mood of so many Christian people today. People who are secretly despondent, cowed and in a sense always on the defensive. And what we so greatly need in our generation, my dear friends, is the opening of our eyes to the great glory and majesty of God as the Creator. I tell you, during these days when we were on holiday in the Lake District and standing in places looking out over the vast area of these majestic hills in the north of England and say what you like about the highlands of Scotland, there are some majestic and glorious places in Lakeland. And I found my soul being exalted. God means us to do that to find our hearts lifted up with a sense of the sheer majesty of God who by his word has called all this into being. And I tell you when I think that the kingly Lord who created that infinite beauty is the same God who is setting about the purpose of recreating me in Christ, my heart was lifted up to him in great encouragement.
It was Francis Schaeffer, whom you might suspect I've been reading a bit recently, who said, Our generation has a unique capacity for thinking great thoughts of men and petty thoughts of God. They see him as the sovereign Lord of creation. Secondly, in verses 25 and 26, they see him as the sovereign Lord of history. These two verses are, of course, a quotation from Psalm 2, one of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament, incidentally, and a psalm of great significance of it. One of the scholars who writes on the psalms, Arthur Weiser, says, This psalm bears witness to a God who is present and active in world history and who knows how to make himself respected by those who do not want to give heed to him and who accomplishes his purpose even though men rebel against him. Now the immediate picture of the psalm is of course of the accession and anointing of a new king, a king whom God has chosen, most probably David himself, and the rebellion of kings and rulers of the earth against that earthly king. And that rebellion the psalmist sees as a rebellion against the Lord and against his anointed. Now the apostles recollect this psalm in their crisis. And the very idea in the psalm of the raging of the nations and the vaunting of men against, against God is ludicrous because he who sits in the heavens will laugh. The Lord will have them in derision. The idea of mere puny man rebelling against the King of kings and the Lord of glory is ludicrous to the psalmist. Because the Lord is the one who reigns and whose government over the affairs of men and nations will be vindicated. Whatever the scene in the world, whatever the rage of men against God, however men may choose to ignore him, he who sits in the heavens will of the last word. To whom does ultimate power belong? Oh, my dear friends, I hope you're clear about this. It does not reside in Washington or London or Moscow or Peking. It resides in the throne of the Lord God omnipotent on whose shoulders the government has been placed. Let me quote Weiser to you again. What the psalmist sees, he says, is that at the center of history is no longer the struggle of the great powers, but God, whose relationship with the earthly powers will determine their destiny. His vision of history is theocentric. Now that's an unfamiliar word which simply means that he sees God at the center of history. Do you see that? When you read your daily newspaper, when you view the scene of the world and of our na own nation, do you see it all as God at the center of history? Now that also is used this conviction of God's lordship in history in these two similar ways in scripture it's used by men as a bulwark to their confidence in God you remember in 2 Chronicles 20 how Jehoshaphat the king had news of the impending disaster which was coming upon his people and as he saw the Moabites and the Ammonites coming upon them and heard word a great multitude is coming against you from Edom. Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord and Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and he cried, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? Now listen to this. Dost thou not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? In thy hand are there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? That's the conviction of a man who has come to see that ultimate power belongs to God, not to men. 
but it is also used by God to persuade men to trust him. And so you find God recalling history. It's a very significant thing. We've come across this again and again in Scripture. Have you noticed it? How God will say, I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. I am the God who brought your fathers up out of the Red Sea and into the land of promise. And he goes on to recount to them how he has ordered circumstances, knocked aside his enemies, cast down men who rebel against them, opened a way for his people. What is he doing? He's not merely giving them a history lesson in order that they might be historical scholars. He is giving them a lesson in God's sovereignty in history. And therefore he appeals to them that now they will trust and obey him in this situation. He is the sovereign Lord of history. Now that's true in our personal history as well. No man ever spoke more clearly or powerfully of that than Joseph when you remember as his brothers came to him and all the sorry story of their treachery and cruelty began to be poured out and they found that their sin would find them out in the last day and Joseph as he looks at them even speaks of that kind of experience in his life and he says in Genesis 50 you meant it for evil to me but God meant it for good. Do you see the point? He had seen that God was not just the sovereign Lord of history in general, but the sovereign Lord of his personal history. That leads us to the third way in which they address God. He is not only sovereign Lord of creation and of history, he is also sovereign Lord of redemption. You notice in verse 27 and 28, the apostles certainly see this psalm as a messianic psalm, that is, as a psalm that really speaks about Christ. They believe that the psalmist perhaps sang better than he knew and more than he thought, but what he was singing about was really the exalted King of Kings, anointed by God, even the Lord Jesus Christ, against whom the nations of the earth would rage and men would plot and devise his downfall as well. And so they move from history in general to the history of redemption in particular. And here above everywhere else, they see God turning the wrath of men to praise him and to bless us. Verse 27, truly in this very city there were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus whom thou didst anoint. That is the anointed one at the end of verse 26. Both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Now there he has set the scene, you see, and set the stage for all that was happening when our Lord Jesus was brought to trial and judgment. Now what was really happening there? This is what the apostles are grasping, you see. And they are leading us into the sovereignty of God in our redemption. What was happening? Is it to be explained by Herod and Pontius Pilate and the people of Israel and the Gentiles and the raging of men and the gnashing of their teeth? And the cruelty of the Roman soldiers. Is that how it's to be explained? Ah, no, he says. Listen. There were gathered Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel to do whatever thy hand and thy plan had predestined to take place. Now, that does not mean that God was the author of their wickedness and evil. What it means is this, as someone has written, let me read it to you. It is thus that God rules in the midst of his enemies. And when they do their wicked will most perfectly, they become mere tools for his high and blessed purpose. 
And this is what is happening at Calvary. It is not that men have done this supremely. It is that God gave him up. And the initiative in all that was happening there on Calvary is God's. That's what they are saying. They are saying it is you who were presiding over this. The real king was Jesus. And Jesus himself brings this home to Pilate. Do you remember how little Pilate, full of a sense of his own importance and authority, strutted around in front of Jesus and said to him, Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? And I would love, I would love to have seen his face when Jesus said to him, You would have no power over me except it was given you by God. And Pilate and Herod and the people of Israel and the Gentiles and the Roman soldiers they were the instrument of God's infinite grace in the glorious plan of redemption. But my dear friends, it encompassed some of the darkest hours of human history. And I guess what these apostles are saying is this. If out of that infinite darkness God could bring our full salvation... What might he not bring out of this hour? That speaks to us of God's sovereignty in accomplishing our redemption. Scripture also tells us that God is sovereign in applying redemption as well. And that is the glorious authority and motivation we have in evangelism that it is God who is drawing a people to Christ it is God who is the author of salvation in every possible sense and I am sure it was a new vision of that that gave these men heart to go out and with great power, as we read in verse 33, to give testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus with great grace upon them all. He is sovereign Lord of creation. He is sovereign Lord of history. He is sovereign Lord of redemption. And now finally, will you look with me at what they have to say about God as sovereign Lord over the contemporary scene? Because this is not merely true of the past. It is not something that they look back to as a curio of antiquity. It is the most relevant reality for the contemporary situation in which they find themselves as it is for us this morning. And now, Lord, they say, look upon our present situation. On account of your sovereign lordship in creation, history, and redemption, look upon our present situation. And grant to your servants boldness to speak your word while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed and so on. Because the character of God does not change, you see. They may now appeal to him for their present situation. This is the God who is not the great I was, but the great I am. He is the unchanging God who in his sovereign control is able to touch the present situation of his children's lives and bring them that glorious assurance that he is a God who does all things well. Let me as we close suggest to you that there are three words which would summarize the conclusion we need to draw in our own lives from this glorious high doctrine because every high doctrine in scripture has a direct line into our daily life and into our personal experience and it has in this case too there are three words that we need to take to ask God to write them in our hearts from this truth of this passage the first is rest 
Now you see the significant thing is that because God reigns, we may rest in him, in his wisdom and power and sovereignty as Jeremiah does in his prayer. There is nothing too hard for thee, he says. And we may therefore rest in God. The sovereignty of God is the doctrine which above all else brings rest into the hearts and minds of believers. So it is that a friend of mine who teaches theology and who is not present here this morning in case you misidentify him. A friend of mine who teaches theology said to me on one occasion when he was uh, chiding me about uh, days off, which uh, not a few distinguished preachers do. He said to me, you know, it's an extraordinary thing how we have the view that the Almighty is incapable of looking after his cause himself while we take a day off, is it not? And it is an amazing thing how we find a lack of rest just because we have a lack of confidence in God's absolute sovereign control. Rather like the lady who says to her husband when they're driving along the countryside, Will you watch the road, dear, while I have a sleep? And sometimes, you know, we imagine that God needs us, as it were, to keep our eye on things for him. My dear friends, in all kinds of circumstances, we need to learn what it is to rest in the Lord because he is the sovereign one. The second word is hope. Now this is what transforms the attitude of the apostles in the early church, you see. They were overwhelmed and outnumbered and it seemed that there was nothing but despair. In precisely the same sense, the modern world in which we live today, in secular society and in the secular intellectual world, men and women are obsessed with despair. Do you realize this? That secular humanism has brought modern man to the place where he really sees no hope. It was the late Arthur Kostler who said, we are going to hell in a handcart and nobody seems to be able to do anything about it. Somebody else wrote recently, humanity seems like a plane load of passengers flying into a storm with nobody at the controls. Now that's exactly the picture of the modern world. Why is that? It is because they do not know our God. It is because they are blind to the fact that our God reigns in glory and that ultimate power belongs to him. And oh, my friends, you and I need to live in the light of that glorious, solid hope. Not the kind of hope that has doubt attached to it. We hope it may be a nice day tomorrow and know very well that it may not be. But the confidence of a hope that does not make ashamed. Now that's true of personal life too. Because the sovereign control of God upon every area of the lives of his children is such that all things are working together for good to those who love him. Do you really believe that this morning? Do you believe that there is not an area of your life, not an atom of your experience which God is not controlling together for your good and his glory? That's what this doctrine implies. And here's the last thing. If it implies rest and hope, it also implies obedience. God's kingly rule is always personal, you see. And the sovereignty of God is not a doctrine to be held in isolation from the servant's obedience. We may not claim it in a merely clinical, academic, theoretical sense. The primary claim of this doctrine is upon the glad bowing of every area of our life before him as king and lord. Crown him the Lord of life. And if rest and hope are the comfort of this doctrine, 
Obedience is the challenge of it. We are going to sing in a moment, the Lord is King. But that really is the issue. And it is the question. Is he king? Really? Is he king over every area of your life this morning? Or are you amongst those who are rebelling against the Lord and against his anointed in some area of your life? God give us obedience, God give us hope, God give us rest, let us pray. Father we bless you that you are the King of Kings, exalted in your sovereign majesty high above all. But oh we pray this morning that we may gladly crown you. Lord of all, we ask it through Christ our Redeemer. Amen.